Sweet. So, uh, the, you guys are here because um, you like pain and suffering, and you want to know more about how to experience more discipline and suffering in your life. Um, my, I won't go about it my normal my normal way of, of doing things, but let's pray first. Lord, I thank you for uh, your goodness and your mercy. God, I thank you for uh, how you provide abundantly for our needs. Uh, not just when we can see it, but especially, Lord, I thank you for providing for our needs when we cannot see it, and when uh, when we are blinded to your goodness uh, due to our, uh, our our shortness or the limitations of who we are, or due to the, the severity of situations um, that, that our eyes cannot quite see as far as you can. We thank you for being merciful to us, Lord. Oh, Jesus, you are good to us. Amen. All right. So the title of this one that I assigned me um, is Love, Suffering, Discipline. The Lord disciplines those he loves. And we'll read that. We're going to go through a couple different verses, uh, read them, and, and take them apart. Um, but the, the thrust of the idea being, if God loves me, or grammatically incorrect, if God loved me, then why am I experiencing so much suffering um, in this session? We will look at the um, relationship between love, suffering, and discipline. So, a uh, variety of reasons as to why you guys picked this one, as to any of the other ones, which are all good. Um, but the why why is there suffering? Um, I don't have my notes. I'll just write these up so I don't forget them later. So, what what are some reasons as why if someone came up to you and said? Why is there suffering? What would just be some default answers that you would give them? People are dying. People are dying. We live in a fallen world. Sin. Fallen world. Sin or fallen world. That looks like world. Okay. Rejection of Christ. Of Christ, okay. Um, or God in his word. And to God. Okay, so uh, consequences. Or do just consequences, because I have to finish the rest of that. Any other, what do you guys think? Any, what, what reasons would you guys give us? Just what's up there. Okay, all right. Well, good. Then you guys have not exhausted my outline. Um, <laughs> so I do have some material that will, that will add to what you might think. I am going to put discipline and suffering in the same category. You can use them in particular locations or more technical sense, but I'm going to use them interchangeably uh, for the most part. For example, or the reason why, um, when a child disobeys and the child must be spanked, that child is suffering, but the child's also being disciplined. But what we're going to see in Scripture is all suffering in one way or another is connected with discipline. Uh, the... Uh, if you go to the gym and you exercise, you are suffering. Right? But we normally we normally don't think of that term. We, we wouldn't say, I'm suffering at the gym the same way I'm suffering if I lost a loved one. We wouldn't say that that's the same suffering in the sense, but that they're in the same flavor. They're in the same area. There is suffering that's going on. Why is this suffering going on? Well, if, if a kid is being disobedient and they're suffering because of discipline, they brought it upon themselves, but if you were going to the gym and you were suffering, it's because you were bringing discipline upon yourself. <coughs> so that's the difference between being disciplined or self-disciplined. So a requirement of elder overseer is not just to be self-controlled, but to be self-disciplined. Can you inflict pain and suffering on your own life to complete something? A kindergartner generally <coughs> is, well, maybe let's go to second grade. Kindergarten, they're excited about school. Second grader is done with school. They're done with this. They, they don't want anything to do with it. And so you have to inflict discipline upon them. But for them, what does it feel like? Suffering. But even for you, as you are inflicting that discipline on the second grader to learn, whether you're the parent or a teacher or a tutor, as you're inflicting that discipline on them and causing them suffering, it's not because you hate them, but in fact, it's because you love them, right? You're saying, I want them to excel. I want them to be a good student. I want them to be knowledgeable, learn how to study things, how to read things, how to apply these things. Then... At some point, though, the, the, the dream and the delight of, of all parents and all teachers is that that student, whatever the student is, boy, girl, young, old, 
gets to a point where the student no longer requires the teacher to cause them suffering and discipline, but rather the student goes and picks up the heavy book on their own. The student goes and picks up the heavy subject on their own and says, I'm going to inflict this pain on me. So with the ultimate goal of, uh, so Fino, uh, I don't know if it was a year or two years ago now, uh, you went and you took the test for being an electrician. I forget the titles of the tests. Um, can you refresh me of the names of those tests uh, for your certification? Oh, contractor's Contra license. So contractor's license and... Two years ago, it was just a contract. Oh, just the one. Okay. Yeah. So once again, so There's long. two tests. Two tests. There's two tests to the one that I think. Yeah. Okay. That's where I was getting to. Um, how long were those tests? Give or take. I mean, like half an hour? Oh, yeah, it was like 120 questions. 120 questions. You know, you get like three hours. Three hours, hours right? Each year. Three hours each, so six hours of tests. Um, you didn't just like, you weren't going to the mall and walk by a kiosk and said, hey, you want a contractor's license? Yeah, how much? Oh, just $30, right? And you just take it and you move on. You're like actually had to go learn and study, pick up books. No one told you you have to go pick up these books. You could have gone and been an electrician for, you know, um, you know, uh, down the street electrician.com or whatever. You know, you could have said, I'm just going to work under them. I'm going to let them do all the hard work. We used to go, I want to be an electrician. Oh, I want to do bookkeeping. Oh, I want to do finances. Oh, and I want to do HR. Oh, and I want to do marketing. You know, so you're like, why would you inflict all that pain upon you, which some days no longer feels like self discipline. It actually feels like suffering. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, for the farmers in the room, you go, Oh, I want the bounty and the goodness of fruit and animals, and all of this, right, and flowers and everything. So what I want to do is I'm going to inflict the damage and the pain and the suffering of having to be responsible for all this. I'm going to go plant all these seeds, and then now I have to water them, and I have to go weed them, and I have to get gophers out, and I have to go keep the sheep away from eating the plants that we're going to eat so that I can eat the sheep later. <laughs> you know, you, all of this is, is causing suffering or discipline, right? You guys, I hope by now can see that, that interplay, that suffering and discipline are not two isolated things, but there is an interplay there. Do you guys see that? Are you going with that? Yeah? But then, oh, can I ask a question? Go ahead, yeah, absolutely. Well, you just said they're the same, but would that depend Interplay, on their, interplay. But would that, um, how do you look at things? Yeah. I mean, because I love, or whatever, the discipline of raising sheep or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's a joy because that's what I want to do. Right. So, that's not still suffering, right? Well, so here it's a suffering, but once again, it's a, so it's a suffering, but it's, it could be a good suffering or a bad suffering. It could be a good discipline or a bad discipline, depending on the particulars of the situation. So if you um, get hit by a car and they have to open up your abdomen um, to save your life, that's suffering, but it's good suffering, right? If you are <coughs> impregnated as a woman, and you have to go through labor and all that. It is suffering, but it's good suffering, right? It's you're like, I I would do anything to give up this suffering, except give up the fruit of this suffering. I I'd, I'd be willing to give up the pain as long as I still get the fruit. But often the way it is with God, you know, the things of uh, the kingdom of heaven, we don't get to give up that suffering and gain the fruit. We don't get to give up the discipline to gain the fruit. But at the same time. Now, outside of the context of God, all that suffering is, we go through this pain and suffering, and really this comes down to that idea of the anti-God. I, I don't care about God. This is why you're suffering. So the Christian suffers, the non-Christian suffers. The, the lover of God suffers, the hater of God suffers. It's not, once I become a Christian, it's like, wait, I signed up on the Christian contract, suffering and discipline's out the window. Falsely, we may believe that. You know, fleshly, we may want that. But the Bible says the godly and the ungodly suffer alike, but the difference is, I mean, even there's a promise that the godly will suffer, um, but, the, but the difference is the suffering of the Christian, or we're going to see this played out, the suffering of the Christian is for our benefit, for our sanctification, for the glory of God, but the suffering of the unbeliever is because of their sin. Like the, It is... Um, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. So why does God cause an unbeliever to suffer? Because he wants them, as we saw in Pastor Ty Bramwell, why did he send the snakes? So that the people would die? No, so that they would, in their affliction, turn to Christ in faith 
and believe? Uh, why has God permitted suffering in this world? And there's a myriad of reasons, but one of the reasons is that uh, we would turn to Christ and say, Lord, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want this. Uh, but the I don't want this is not exchanged with, well, then you won't suffer anymore. The I don't want this is exchanged with, there is now purpose and meaning to your suffering. Before the, the suffering was, you're a sinner, so you shall suffer to taste hell, to um, push you towards heaven. But as a Christian, we taste suffering to be drawn again towards heaven even further. One is that we would repent, the other is that we would be sanctified. So we're going to look at some, some things. Uh, there's the first section we're going to spend the most of the time in, which is uh, what produces discipline or suffering. And i got four categories there. Uh, what produces discipline or suffering. And then the last part, um, which is uh, probably the last quarter or so, uh, will be God remembers and God will redeem your suffering. And then in parentheses, even if that suffering is your own fault. <laughs> which is useful. Which is helpful to know. Which is encouraging. So God produces, uh, or rather, what produces discipline and suffering? Uh, love produces suffering. Right? Well, you got, you're going to have to convince me of this. <laughs> um, there, are th- there are three entities that will see that uh, love produces suffering. I'm going to if you have your Bibles, please, uh, we're going to bounce around these. I've, I've limited myself to a single verse per point, um, but there is a there is a plethora of scriptures that you could go to find others uh, to prove this. But the first one is uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, and in all reality, you could uh, stick in I, I, I thought to spend a great deal of time in Hebrews 12. Um, at the very beginning of when I was preparing for this, but then I, I decided to not. So I encourage you to read all of chapter chapter 12 of Hebrews. Um, and it says, I'll start in verse 5 though, uh, Hebrews 12, 5. It says, And have you forgotten the exhortation uh, that addresses you as sons? And again, adoption. Uh, Pastor Stephen Fetters, not Pastor, sorry, Stephen Fetters, uh, last night he said, uh, see what love, right? The first one, see what love, he's loved us, he's called us sons of God, children of God, right? We have been, we have been given an equal, and there's some careful theological language here, equal status as Christ in sonship. We are not God, we're not part of the Trinity, but God looks at Christ as a son and now looks at us as children, uh, adopted, right? And so, have you forgotten that it addresses your son? So the rebuke, the discipline that we experience from God is he because we're his sons, we're his daughters, we're children. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Right? We see this context, discipline, and it's still... And what happens when you're being disciplined by the Lord? You are suffering. He is disciplining. We are suffering. Uh, nor be weary would be proved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Uh, and it goes on later to talk about how this is applied to parents as well. But in, in no uncertain terms, in the clearest of terms, God disciplines those he loves. So why am I suffering? There's um, there's a thing called grief share uh, out there, and one of their tenets there's like two or three things they come and, and share grief, and usually it's around death. But one of the things is they say, well, it's it's a it's a you're not allowed to say it. it's a do not say rule that a grief share has is you're not allowed to say God uh, God took my loved one from me. You're not allowed to, that that's we do not hold that theology. That theology is anathema in that in grief share. But the reality is, yeah, he did. We don't like to say that. What this goes back to, I don't like that aspect. I don't like that God is so sovereign, so in control, that he has permission, and not even permission, he has the authority and the right to pull someone that I love from me. Like, you don't have that right, God. I decide what you do. Who took him? Did, Did the devil take him? So you mean the devil has more control over 
that individual. Um, the but why does God allow suffering? Why does He allow us to experience discipline? Because He loves us. Or why I don't like that. I don't like that. Does the Father love the Son? Yes. Does the Son love the Father? Yes. Why did the Father send the Son to the cross? Because He loves Him. Why did the Son go to the cross? At the uh, at the request at the request at the command of the Father. Because, so we draw near to him. Yep, but even before we draw near, because he loves them. Yeah. But that there is there is a love and and we say that, but uh, if God if God inflicts this suffering or discipline in my life, our mind goes, He must not love me. He must not love me. If I'm suffering, God doesn't love me. And we've experienced this on a human level. If you're a parent, you've experienced it with a child. If you're a child, you've experienced it as a child. You don't love me, mom and dad. Why? Because you just spanked me, or because you ground me, or because you, you know, whatever disciplined me. What do they do? Tears turn on. You don't love me. You don't love me. But the parent, the parent can do one of two things, and they're both appropriate. One can laugh roarlessly. Oh, you silly fool. Oh, I love you. Right? But oh, Or the other one is to draw them up and say, of course I love you. I love you too much. So I've, I've told my kids when I've spanked them, I, I love you too much to see you go to jail. I love you too much to encourage you to go to hell. Right? I'm going to discipline you because I want to keep you from something. And so my discipline toward you is because I love you. I want you to be a productive, useful uh, unit of society someday who's able to manage your own affairs and so I'm going to discipline you in such a way to draw you to that. Not because I hate you. If I hated you, I wouldn't discipline you. What the world says is allow kids to not be disciplined. Right? So we, if we see that as an apparent a child relationship, then how much more so is that of, of the Heavenly Father and us as adopted sons and daughters of God? If he disciplines us, it's because he loves us. If he did not discipline us, it's because he hates us. You know, that no one's, no one's seen a neglected child and said, clearly that child is loved. We would say, that child needs someone to love them. And so we, we need to look at one aspect, not every situation, and not in every circumstance, but we need to look at our suffering and go, Lord, even in the midst of this, you're showing me that you love me. You have not abandoned me, you've not forsaken me, but you've held me near, and you're still holding me close. So what produces love suffering? Well, God, just the love of God. Um, and in parallel, we could stay here in Hebrews to see this, but instead I'm going to go to Proverbs 13:24 to see this. The second thing of love, there's there's three in total of love that causes this one. Um, the second one is parents. Um, the love of a parent causes us suffering. <laughs> uh, let me see. Proverbs 13, verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Right. I'm not going to spend too much time here. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an earthly reminder of what's going on in the spiritual reality. If God loves us as children, he will discipline us. And so in likewise manner, if parents love their children, they will discipline their children. So why are we suffering? Well, it could be because um, God is demonstrating his love for us and is correcting us or is drawing us towards him. Or why are we suffering? Well, because I'm a child and I'm suffering. But here's here's where we see the divine mystery of things. There's an interplay. Um, if the child is suffering... Who is the one inflicting the discipline? Well, it's the adult, the human. But God is the one that is actually ultimately inflicting that by giving that child a godly parent. Right? That child has been given a godly parent to do godly things in a godly way. Ultimately, uh, all these things are, are um, wrapped in and surrounded in love. So why is, when a child goes, why am I suffering? You know, because God loves you. Well, why are you making me suffering? Because I love you. <laughs> You, you guys can see the interplay. And then the third one of why am I suffering? Why am I experiencing the discipline of the Lord? And that is because you have the love of a friend. 
Um, Proverbs 27, 6. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Would you rather experience the flattery of an enemy, right? They just, they're blowing smoke, right? Would you prefer the flattery or would you prefer the hard truth that stings a little bit from a friend? Now, immediately, what do we say? Just give me the flattery, <laughs> right? But we know if we think about it, I needed my friend to tell me something I didn't want to hear. Uh, for the pastors, uh, uh, we, for their book bag, we have given them uh, one of the books is having friends in pastoral ministry. And the, and the reason why is pastors need to have friends. Everyone should have a friend. The argument in the book is, although friend isn't an explicit command, friend is clearly uh, natural and normal of human experience. And so therefore, we ought to have friends. Right? We, ought, we ought to have friends. And, and he goes and makes an argument. But with pastors, pastors can get in a spot where no one speaks to them, right? Because everyone that they know sees in a position of authority, so no one is able to speak in their life. And there was a pastor that I'm aware of. Uh, he's no longer pastoring. But anytime someone rebuked him, and this is not a joke, and he's not the only pastor who's ever done this, would say, how dare you strike the Lord's anointed? I understand what he's saying, but even if even if the rebuke is coming from a fool, truth is truth no matter the source. I may not like the source, but it's still good uh, if it's true. And so we are better to be wounded by a friend than be lied to by an enemy. And so sometimes we're going to experience pain and suffering by a friend, and we may be tempted to say, uh, uh, and, and I, I war against this too, if he loved me, guy speaking of a guy friend, if she loved me, girl speaking of a girlfriend, if he loved me, he wouldn't have said that to me. Right? If she loved me, she wouldn't have called that out. Right? Or, I'm, I'm, some, you go and you complain. She says something. You're thinking, you go to someone else. She said, well, it's not, I'm not bothered by what she said, it's how she said it. <laughs> right? You know? I, um, how, how else can you say your breath stinks? Please brush your teeth, right? You know, uh, you know, there's there's certain things. It's there, there's no nice way. There's no nice way. Uh, and so, why am I suffering? Why is my friendship on the rocks? And in that book, uh, it goes on to say basically that's a uh, the, the friends that are friends indeed are the ones that receive a rebuke and still continue the friendship. Um, and so, that there's one copy of that book available. Uh, on the free book library. And then there's one in the library, so if you guys want to just look through it, all the stuff applies to non-pastors. It's just a, a lot of the terminology, a lot of the discussions in the context of pastoral ministry. But, uh, so pursue friendship. All right. So what produces discipline or suffering? Love of God, love of parent, love of friend. I'm going to pause there. Any thoughts or questions uh, or, or nuance to, to that so far? Loving if you don't see something. Depends what it is. So, um, uh, I'm trying to try to fabricate some things. Uh, we were listening. I, uh, Katie and I were listening to it. Well, I listened to the podcast and I sent it to her. Sometimes you just gotta let things go, right? Uh, and I, I pastoral, I pastoral, I, I pastorally counsel husbands. You know, as you're raising your children, but as you're helping to, you know, disciple your wife and draw, you can't call out everything. You got to be able to leave room for the Holy Spirit, right? And so at some point, you're actually not being loving because you're just now you're just nagging, right? And so you've actually transgressed the point where now you're just you're nagging, you're nitpicking. And so uh, verse is, well, I just won't say anything at all. So there is a so. And I've heard this in other contexts or about other things, so I'll apply it to this context. If you have a tendency to not say things, you probably need to say things more often. If you have a tendency to say things, you probably need to not say things as much. 
again, that would be a little bit more circumstantial. You go back and say something. You find the best time. You know, there's the middle of the party. Probably not the time to have a conversation, you know, like, hey, let's go do it. But the sooner the better. But if you're like, what if I don't say anything? It depends what it is, right? They're beating the baby. I just, I don't want to be mean to them. That's not loving, right? It's not loving the child or the person doing it. Or it's, they put too much pepper in their spaghetti. Okay, they like pepper. You know, just move on. Eat the peppery spaghetti and sneeze and have a happy day. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay, all right. I'm not trying to make light of it, but joy. Pastor Ty Brownwell is accurate. I do like laughter. Laughter helps us learn. I'm just better at using laughter when I'm not disciplining my kids. When it's not my kids, I'm not playing. Anyways, that has nothing to do with this. Um, all right, so what else? So the one category, love uh, produces discipline or suffering. Um, love a God, love a parent, love a friend. The next thing that causes discipline or suffering is your stupidity. <laughs> I'm not trying to insult you guys. You guys are, this obviously doesn't apply to anyone in here. But the reality is, why am I suffering? Well, because you were a knucklehead. You did something dumb. You know, like, why am I suffering? You know, the government's out to get me. You know, it's like, why? Well, I didn't pay my taxes for 10 years. Like, because you forgot? No, stupid government, they don't get my money. So now they're, you know, shutting down your bank accounts, you know, collecting your property. That suffering is not, you know, God is using that. God is overseeing that. But you put yourself in that spot, right? Or uh, there's one guy in youth group. Hey, I'm uh, being persecuted at school. Why? Well, they're not letting me read the Bible. Hey, man, what? well, tell me what happened. Well, I was there just reading the Bible. The teacher said, don't read it. I'm like, hey, yeah. Well, and the, we knew the guy. I'm like, well, tell us more. Well, it was in math class. Well, like, was it like you'd done your project and you were like, now you had free time? It was high school, so okay, you have 30 minutes to complete the project, and then after that, read a book or whatever. No, I just decided I'd do the project at home and, you know, I just read the Bible right then and there. I'm like, you see, this is not God ordained suffering. This is um, stupid ordained suffering. Um, yeah, you know, self inflicted stupidity is is your own bad. Again, Proverbs speaks to this. Uh, Peter uh, experienced this often. You know, no Lord, <laughs> man, never be Lord. Uh, Paul had rebuked Peter, but self self inflicted. Uh, Proverbs twenty two three. I've always loved this proverb. It's, it's just been a, a comical view. But Proverbs 22, 3 says, The prudent, or the wise, sees danger and hides himself. But the simple go on and suffer for it. Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, there's a scene where they go and they attack the bunny, right? And the bunny's got Scott teeth, look at the bones, right? And they're like, you're an idiot, right? And so they just charge in. The other guy's like, no, I'm, I'm hiding behind the rock. I'm not going into that thing. Every, but the other people, they just look at the, the danger, and they're honest, there's no danger, and they just pff, head on into it. Uh, the, uh, the wise, hopefully, learning from, ex- learning from the experience of others, from the instruction of the Lord, learned about danger and said, ah, I'm not going to do that, right? The wise learn from experience. Don't look down the barrel of a gun. Or not by experience, but by wisdom. The wise learn by wisdom. Don't look down the barrel of a gun. The fool says, yeah, but what if? Yeah, but what if, right? Uh, the, the wise says, always treat a gun like it is loaded. Never even just pull the trigger. Maybe if everything's clear, don't pull the trigger without knowing that if something discharges, you're in a safe shooting area. It's downrange. It's in a safe spot. The fool goes, oh, whatever, and, you know, there's, that's where you will hear about people shooting themselves. Uh, the, the wise know, you know, nothing good's going to happen, you know, watching TV or stream, scroll on the internet after 10 o'clock at night. The fool goes, who cares, right? You know, there's, the, the, the wise see something, and, and oftentimes we suffer, and we go, nah, this is your own fault. In our culture at large, there is the, um, the logical fallacy of don't blame the victim or your victim blame you or something like that. The why says, 
do not dress in skimpy clothing um, and go to the club at midnight. Right? Don't don't do that. Don't dress females. Don't dress in skimpy clothing. Go to the club at midnight. The wife says that is not good. The world says don't don't you know just we need to focus on the evil doer. Yeah, we do need to address the evil doer, but we also say it. Don't flash your cash. Right? You don't just walk down the sh- down the street with a wad full of cash, just flower it for the world to see. What do you do? Put the money away, right? If someone wanted to rob you with the money in your pocket, money in the purse, or money in your hand, they could do it. But you're going to present yourself as a greater target of robbery if you're just kind of look at the cash I have, right? It's just kind of falling out of my pockets, and the wise go, you know, this is, and we could say, well, it's not my fault that they robbed me. You know, they could have robbed anyone. Yeah, but you let them know that you're a better target for robbery. And so sometimes we experience suffering or discipline. Um, and we don't want to have a, uh, you can go to a sinful place with this, but we want to assess, what did I do that got me here? What did it, or not what did, was there anything that I did that got me here? Was there something that got me here? I remember one time complaining to my bride. I said, I don't know how I ended up in three bands at one time. And she goes, because you said yes three times. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, you know, the, so, sometimes you just, I don't know what, how did I got in this spot, how I got in this difficult moment. And so the stupidity goes a long way to cause us suffering and affliction. Any thoughts or questions on that one? <laughs> like, been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. <laughs> threw the t-shirt away. Forgot why I had to go back. All right, so then the next one is why Why am I suffering or what produces suffering? And that is that we might grow in godliness or grow in Christ-likeness. If you would, if you're able to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And then verse 12. And this is seen in the Beatitudes. This is seen in the words of Christ in many places in the Gospel. But here it's made abundantly clear. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why am I suffering, Lord? Remember when you said, Lord, I want to put away anything that is not of you, and I want to be like Christ. I want to be like Christ. I want to be like Christ. Lord, make me like Christ. Sanctify me. Purify me. Get rid of that sin. Mortify that sin in me. I want to be like Christ. You want to be godly? I want to be godly. I'll make you godly. You're going to suffer. Lord, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done. Lord, come on, Lord. Is there any other option? Is there like the fast track? Can I um, can I test out of this class? Right in college, you can test out of certain classes. Can I test out of this class? Right? Can I just jump over it? I'm taking seminary classes. I was able to test out of all three of my. I didn't even have to test out of. Don't don't tell me. I didn't even have to test out of my Hebrew classes. That I talked with the teacher. He looked at my. My classes I took, he says, I'm not even going to take a test. My Greek teacher didn't even care. And I'd taken more Greek classes than Hebrew classes. Didn't even care. I'm like, oh, so I had to take the test. And that test was miserable, right? Like, but I want to improve. Okay. Now I have to take this third semester of Greek. And it is the hardest semester, right? Because it's the one that I've never really had to take. This is dumb. Like, oh, this is, oh, Lord, I don't want to get better at Greek, but I want it easy. Right? Not going to happen, right? Lord, I want to be like Christ. I want to be like Christ. Okay. You're going to suffer. Is there any other way? No. No, it's not. Uh, the only way that we can be like Christ is to experience what Christ experienced. Christ came to experience what we experienced, right? He put on flesh, dwelt among us, so that he could bear our infirmities, bear our sins. But now we want to be like him. He says, okay, well then walk the path that I've walked. Walk in the steps that I've walked. That means suffering, that means affliction. Or like, I prefer not, Lord. And then he says, do you trust him? Yeah. (laughs) 
but I'd still prefer not. <laughs> but, you know, let me know if it, let me know if an easy pass comes by. If there's a fast track, if I can just zip a line, right? What do they have? Yeah, fast track on the freeway. Or you get a Disneyland, you can fast track, get around the line. Like, if one of these shows up, let me know because I'm going to take that one. But if not, the line or the difficulty, the pain, the suffering, the discipline that comes before the fruit, I'm willing to endure. Right? Why do moms keep getting pregnant? Right? Because yeah, they like kids. Right? Uh, why do why do godly couples stay together even when marriage has been hard? Because there's fruit. There, there's things there that it's worth it. Why continue being a Christian if it, we know that we're going to suffer? Because the fruit's worth it. The reward is worth it. I, I would rather gain the reward through suffering then avoid temporary suffering to gain eternal suffering. We gain an eternal perspective and things begin to become more clear. Not necessarily more easy. Right? They tell you uh, if you're in wilderness survival, if you have water, um, the, if you have water, one canteen of water, and you don't know where you're going, should you, uh, conserve a little bit at a time, or she just drink it as you're thirsty. What do you guys think? If you don't know where you're going, you're lost. You don't know where you're going. But you have a cat team. Do you drink when you're thirsty, or do you do you pace it out? Conserve. Conserve. Uh, okay. So if you know where you're going, do you drink it all, or do you conserve? Drink it as you're thirsty, or conserve. Drink it as you're thirsty. Because I know I'm going to get water somewhere else. Yeah. So the exact opposite. Um. If you don't know where you're going, you don't know the destination, drink it. But if you know where you're going, conserve that time. So if you know you have a day or two days, I want to conserve this water. right? But if you don't know where you're going, drink it until you're thirsty. Uh, because that way you have the energy necessary. Because you don't know you could get there tomorrow. You could be weak, but you need as much energy on the front end to find, to be unfit. if you will, by analogy, the world doesn't know what their end is, and so they drink of the passions. They, they break the drink of, of all the joys of this life. Uh, uh, but the, the Christian, we got to push this analogy over. The Christian knows the destination, says, I'm going to I'm gonna engage carefully here. I know, I know where I'm going. I know how much time this is going to take. And so we go, but I don't know if I'm going to live a year or 70 years. But we know it's a year or 70 years, not a year or a thousand. Right? I can, can I make it 70 years trusting Christ? Yes. There's more to it than that. But I can make, I can make, if I, I can trust Christ for 70 years. Christ can get me through for 70 years. I can endure that. And so we, we take a, a, a faith wager. I trust God that that is word. Take, take the suffering that he's given me. And the end is worth it. Right? Then the end is worth it. Um, which then leads us into the fourth one of what, what produces suffering. Uh, uh, it might be better said, what does suffering produce? What does suffering produce? Uh, and this is this is the dramatic shift. This is the dramatic. You know, who done it? You know, it was revealed at the end of the movie, or the, you know, at the end of the book. What, rather than uh, what produces suffering, but what does suffering and discipline produce? Your joy. Um, now, we're not talking about a looting to, you know, who's just, oh, I love suffering, it's amazing! You know, we're, we're not talking about a looting to, but in a very real way, in a true joy, a, a sincere joy. First Peter chapter four, great, great chapter, uh, great section. But First Peter chapter four, verse twelve through sixteen. Uh, but all, all of this chapter, you read twelve to the end of the, the letter, is good. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Okay, we, we've covered that. Don't be surprised, right? Godly love, stupidity, right? As if something strange were happening. Why is this happening to me? Don't don't be surprised. But rejoice. <laughs> yeah, 
Here, what, what am I supposed to do in suffering? Find a way out. No, that's not what it says. It says rejoice. Rejoice as far as, so meaning, as long as your suffering is for being righteous, not for being a fool. So, oh yeah, I stole money, so I'm going to jail. Yay, I get to suffer. No, don't rejoice there. I told someone, hi, my neighbor, hi, just, I was saying them hi, and, because I love them in Christ, and they're flipping me off. I love you, Lord. Reason Lord, why? Because you suffered, you shared Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a messenger. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. All right. For it is the time of judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? So why, why does God allow us to go through suffering? So that we might rejoice. So it was the joy set before Christ that he endured the cross. Again, not a Looney Tune, not a uh, 19 caricature, you know, padded van, padded room, mad, insanity joy of your, you're out of your mind. Um, but recently dealing with the loss of my father, I'm not the first person to lose someone I love. But the only thing I can describe what it was supernatural joy. I wasn't gig- giggling. Um, I wasn't ignoring uh, reality. But I wasn't in the in the in the deepest of despair. Now again, uh, you know, different suffering, different discipline is going to affect people different ways. So we say, okay, Lord, I trust you for how you're drawing me through this. Uh, we might ask, Lord, what are you teaching me in this moment? We might ask that. Okay, well, I need to have a spiritual reason. Okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? How to rejoice. I thought that's what songs are for, right? Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice, right? Um, like, <laughs> you know, crush your toe and break your finger again. I say rejoice. <laughs> like, oh, we're... But why? what produces uh, discipline or suffering? So, love of God, love of God, love of parent, love of friend, your stupidity, growing in godliness, and then it produces joy. So, looking to the end, God remembers and will redeem all of your suffering. Even your suffering that is your own fault. The best works of the unbeliever will not be redeemed. But even the foolish works of a believer will be redeemed. That's a strange mystery. Now, Pastor Ty Bramwell, he mentioned that. The, uh, the, the ears of the believer are more holy than the lips of the preacher. And that's the first time I heard it, but I'm like, I like that. God is doing something supernaturally, right? Uh, even things that we err and do wrongly, God turns for good. Uh, I can say this as a uh, someone who works with wood. There's been times I made a mistake, and then I just kept working, and it oh that actually worked out better than I planned. <laughs> if that happens on a human level, obviously God is orchestrating those things. How much more when we do something dumb and God says, well, you're a broken tool. Um, you're not sharp. You're, you're, you're blunt. You're dull. You're, you know, you're, you're crooked, right? How much more he goes, but even, but the, the old, the old saying of old, God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. So even though we are not useful tools in and of ourselves, we become useful tools in the hand of God. Right? So even when we, when we make mistakes, God still uses those mistakes. Any of those mistakes are ours. God uses that suffering, uh, and he re- remembers all of our suffering, and he redeems it. Psalm 56, 8. Uh, take a time, I'm not going to be able to read these. But Psalm 56, 8 says that God stores all of our tears in a bottle. He writes them all down in a book. So every sorrow, every pain, every discomfort, um, God remembers, and not only does he remember, but the implication is he will redeem it. Not in a salvific sense, but in the sense that he will redeem it and make it useful for something. So you take a, a ticket, and you want to redeem this ticket for What is this ticket? You go to the old like, Chuck E. Cheese of old or something like that, and you get all these tickets, and you go redeem them for some junk toy. Um, we take our sorrows to God, and, and he redeems them and turns them into something that we go, God, I, I didn't see that. I didn't see that at all. Uh, 
uh, and John Piper says God hides most of our fruit in this life from us, so we're not always going to know how God is going to redeem it. And I would argue most of the time we're not going to know how God is going to redeem it. We're saying, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. Uh, God also mentions um, through uh, the Holy Spirit in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, the saints are declaring to God, God, how long, how long, how long? And God doesn't say, why are you whining? He essentially says, not yet. Which means he's going to do something with it. It's just going to be in his time, not ours. And even the saints are in heaven waiting for the, the redemption of all things and the consummation of all things, the conclusion of all things of this, this life. God is saying, give it a moment, I'm still in control. And the saints are like, we don't see it. So even the saints that are in heaven right now are saying, Lord, we don't see it. We trust you, we don't see it. In between our songs of holy, 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 we say, but how long? When are you, you going to wrap this thing up, Lord? And they trust him. Um, we also look at Psalm 116, verse 15. Psalm 116, verse 15. Uh, it says that precious in his sight is the death of his saints. Precious in his sight is the death of his saints. So those who die uh, the martyr's death, God counts as precious. If God counts as precious the death of his saints, does he not also count as precious the things which are not as significant? And the answer is yes, and how do we know that? If God cares for the sparrow, does he not care for us? Or if he cares for the hair follicles of our head, no matter how many or how few we have, if God cares for these things, does he not also um, care for us? And so in that sense, uh, we know that God does not allow anything to pass through our life that he will not address or deal with and redeem for his glory and for our benefit. But the question is, will we trust him? And then lastly, and I will turn there for this one, is Psalm 72.14. Well, maybe I inverted that last one. Please give me if I did. Or maybe it's the same thing, just in two different ways. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's similar. So Psalm 116.15 is precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But Psalm 72.14, well, let me say for, uh, start at 12. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor in him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy, and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence he redeems their life, and precious in their blood is his son. From oppression and violence he redeems their life. Either God is lying, or he says that he, he from oppression and violence he redeems their life. Either God is lying and he's not redeeming their life. Or he's redeeming our life in a way that we do not yet see and are trusting him to, to do it. Say, so Lord, are you redeeming this difficulty? And if, he, if it says he is, then we trust him and we act like it. Or he's lying and it's all, it's all junk. But what do we have from the overwhelming testimony of scripture is, no, we can trust it. I just realized I didn't ask enough questions. Uh, are there any <laughs> questions? <laughs> just a thought. Go for it. I, I think about uh, in, in hardship. Um, I know that I always have the peace of God because He promises that. And then His Word says, you know, we go through things, we endure, and endurance. You know, produces yeah. patience, and then we have hope. Yeah. That kind of thing. So I know, no matter what it is, God has an ultimate purpose, and it's yeah. for my best and His glory. Yeah. So that helps a lot if I can focus on that instead of the crisis or the issue or yeah. the pain or whatever. Yeah. Um, Katie and I were told one time. Now this person was a bit more charismatic in what they're saying, but I think there's redemption in what they're saying. Yeah. Don't forget in the valley what God has revealed on the hilltop. Now, what has God revealed on the hilltop? His word. And I was telling a pastor recently, um, I said, while you're in the valley of despair and I'm on this hill of comfort, I can see the summit of Christ and I tell you it's worth it. I said, but I tell you that, but, but I ask one thing of you. 
when I go into the Valley of Despair and you have been raised to the hilltop of comfort. Tell me. And so we, we need to remind ourselves. We need to remind one another. And this is honestly when you go tell a friend, hey, you need to cut, cut it out because God has done good things. Right? God's done good things, so you just cut it out. You're acting like God. You're acting like Jesus did not raise from the grave. Cut it out, right? So there's those hard things. Um, sometimes we need to tell ourselves that, and sometimes God sends his friends to tell us that. And we're like, I don't want to hear it. And then we like, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> or like, why do we say I don't want to read the Bible? Because I don't want to be reminded of the truth. I don't want to give up my faith party. Like, oh, don't do that. Well, let me pray, and we will, we will go on our way. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for suffering. Uh, Lord, if we had it our way, we would be rid of it forever. We would cast it aside. But for whatever reason uh, that is mysterious to us, um, that which we cannot see, we, we trust you for what you have revealed to us. Lord, we trust you that following you is worth enduring uh, even the cross uh, of sin and shame, uh, as Christ did for us. But Lord, thank you that our sin and suffering never even compares to that. Um, our sin and shame, our, our, our suffering we experience is, is always, always uh, a, a fraction. Uh, but Lord, but please remember we are dust, and the suffering we do experience is real. Carry us, Lord, through the very end. We love you, King Jesus. Amen.